Muy buenos días a todas y todos nuevamente. Panel 7 es el último panel de este Foro Global 2023 y el tema no podría ser más adecuado, más oportuno y más importante. Inteligencia artificial, ¿cómo impacta la inteligencia artificial a las democracias y a las elecciones? Y para abordar este tema no podríamos tener un mejor panel, integrado por cuatro estupendos expertos. Primero, Noah Jansiracusa, quien es cientista de data, profesor de la Bentley University y autor del libro How Algorithms Create and Prevent Fake News. Muchas gracias, Noah, por, por estar acá. También nos acompaña Mekela Pandi Aradne, consejera del Programa de Democracia del Centro, Brennan de la Universidad de Nueva York, experta en reforma electoral, seguridad electoral, gobernanza, votaciones y verdad e información. Bienvenida, Mequela. También nos acompaña el profesor Bruce Schneier, profesor de políticas públicas en la Harvard Kennedy School, fellow en el Centro Berkman Klein de Internet y Sociedad. Bienvenido, profesor Bruce Schneier. Y de manera virtual está conectado desde Argentina Federico Álvarez Larrondo, profesor responsable de la Cátedra de Inteligencia Artificial, Tecnología y Derecho de la Universidad Nacional Mar del Plata, Argentina. Bienvenido, Federico Álvarez Larrondo. Gracias por conectarse. Cada uno de los panelistas va a tener entre 7 y 10 minutos para hacer su presentación. La va a hacer desde el podio. Y luego, si el tiempo lo permite, podemos tener un intercambio y un diálogo entre los panelistas. Noah, por favor, tus primeros 7 a 10 minutos. All right, well, thank you for the, the warm invitation. It's been a wonderful event. So, um, Michaela and I worked on a, an article together about how AI is potentially going to impact elections. And we're trying to sort of split our, our talks, our presentations, to cover different aspects of it. So if there's anything that we missed between the two of us, make sure to ask questions. So what I want to cover now is how do we think about artificial intelligence? And this came up a lot on the, the preceding panel, which set us up very nicely. It's very tempting to think of AI as some kind of otherworldly new entity, almost like an alien species that's entering our society and we have to learn how to grapple with it entirely anew. And what I really would like to emphasize, because treating it with that sort of level of mystery and novelty, it makes it difficult to know how we should really act in a very concrete way and in a legalistic, regulatory way. But I think one of the most helpful lenses for trying to understand how to conceptualize and view AI and how to act and treat it is to really look backwards at social media. I think social media involves a lot of AI. I can talk about that. And I think it's really helped show us what it can do, what it can't do, what goes wrong, what are the challenges, what are we able to do, and how do we respond. Um, so turning back to, in the US at least, uh, 2016, when Donald Trump won the US presidency, that was a surprising event. Most people predicted that would not happen, and it did. And we were sort of caught off guard. And the narrative that quickly emerged was that there was so much, at the time they called it fake news. Now the, the more accepted terms are misinformation, if it's just sort of untrue statements, not necessarily designed to mislead, or disinformation when it's deliberately deceptive. So fake news is kind of a loaded term. We try to use those other words now. But the narrative that emerged was that there was a lot of mis- and disinformation, particularly on social media, and that the algorithms that are powering social media were responsible, in part, for spreading the virality of this misinformation. And this may not have you know, convinced millions and millions of people to switch their vote, but the election was so close that even if it just convinces a percent or a fraction of a percent of the US voting population, if that happens in the right states because of the way our, our electoral system works, that could have been enough to swing the election. Well, now we are, what, seven years later, and for better or worse, we still don't really know what the true full story was. In other words, when we look back, it's very hard to know how much did social media actually impact the election. It's very hard to know how much did the algorithms, which actually are a form of AI that power the social media algorithms, how much did they 
impact the spread of misinformation that may or may not have impacted the election. There's just a lot of unknowns, and I think seven years shows that it's very difficult to really understand what kind of true real-world impact these technologies have. And one of the reasons is, what can we measure? We can measure how viral a post goes, right? I can look at some piece of fake news, some misinformation, and see that it's spread across these different platforms. It jumped from YouTube to Facebook to Twitter. We can count the number of impressions. That means how many people viewed it. You know, millions of people saw this. What we can't do so easily, it's very difficult, is to understand what impact it's seeing that have. Did people look at it and laugh and say, that's a silly story, and they reshared it anyway because they felt like it? Did they look at it and fall for it and decide, you know, have a, develop a new world view because of this? Did they look at it and just find it entertaining? A lot of people kind of support a news item if it supports their views, whether or not it's true, right? So for instance, if you were a Hillary Clinton supporter at the time, if you saw something that was pro-Clinton and anti-Trump, Often, what, didn't, what mattered less to you was whether it was true, but whether it was sort of supporting your team. And so a lot of the fake news at the time was pro-Donald Trump, and a lot of Trump supporters spread it. We don't know how much they believed it, and we don't know how much it convinced other people that it was true, but it's just sort of like rooting for your team. It's kind of a fun thing to spread these stories that are made-up scandals about the opponent. So the challenge is moving from the things we can measure online to the real world impact. And humans are complex, we see a lot of things, we process information in complex ways, and we're very social creatures, right? If someone were to convince me to change my political views and how I'm gonna vote and really my understanding of the world, to be honest, that would probably happen more from my family, from my friends, from my close contacts than from some articles I see on social media. So even though we spend a lot of our time in the online world, it's very difficult to change our offline behavior. There are a number of individuals who get very radicalized and we're very concerned that they can go down these sort of rabbit holes on YouTube or other social media platforms, become very radicalized. They seem especially sensitive and prone to this kind of algorithmic distortions. Um, but a lot of people, it's, it's just kind of part of the world that you see things that are true and not and it's all a blend. There's also a big discussion that in the US we have some news outlets like Fox News that tend to be very biased in certain directions, it was very pro-Trump, and it's hard to disentangle how much of the problems that we faced were because of algorithms and social media and how much were just plain old TV anchors that were reporting things in a slanted way. So the reason why I mention all of this is because I think it really helps us frame and understand the new threats coming with AI. The things that I think are really question marks is Yes, the technology, the AI is improving. Everything we saw before, like bot accounts on social media, some run by Russian governments or affiliates that were kind of designed to distort our public conversations, to get people to bring up con uh, controversial issues, even to sway the way we might view um, the presidential candidates and other elections. All of that activity will happen again. It is happening, it's sort of a constant, but the technology that drives it, right? AI can power deep fake images that are much more convincing than we ever saw before. Deep fake audio is a whole new chapter where you can hear someone's voice that sounds very authentic and it's trained on maybe a minute of them speaking. So it's really quite powerful. And of course with text, we have things like ChatGPT. We're now instead of a simplistic bot account that basically is just copying and pasting a bunch of preset propaganda, they can really have AI powering complicated conversational agents that interact and talk and communicate. So the threats are all amped up, and I think this is very much a legitimate concern, but I also think we have to recognize we still don't know what role social media had in our elections or democracy. It's very hard to know what impact AI will have. It's easy to be very concerned and say, People are gonna be brainwashed by these AI bots and all this dystopia is gonna happen. It's also easy to say, well, nothing bad really happened before, so we're kind of used to it, we'll deal with it. We don't know, right? The truth is somewhere in between these extremes. And I think as we move forward and think about potential regulation and what we can really do, it's just really important to recognize that the existence of a hypothetical threat you know, something like a super intelligent AI that can sort of brainwash and manipulate us is not the same thing as a real event occurring that actually changes the way people vote and interact. So absolutely, we do need um, reliable sources of information. We need to find ways of steering people towards this. And having engagement-based social media is unfortunately, I think, a dangerous algorithmic game that really um, 
rewards and encourages entertainment rather than honest information. And that's been um, a dangerous trajectory for our media landscape. I think AI having the ability to produce very convincing in images and audio and text to be able to manipulate on a much more, or attempt to manipulate on a much more personal level, these are very scary things and we absolutely need to be mindful. But again, I think it's also dangerous to overhype the AI and to paint it as this um, mythical creature that can get to know all of us intimately and individually and change the way we think and, and view the world. Because I, I don't think that's where it is. I don't know if, I don't think it necessarily ever will become there. So I think we need a, a sort of calm, rational approach that really looks at the evidence. Again, not just what's out there, not just what is this capable of, but what impact does it have on us humans and our society, knowing again that we are very social. We really talk to other human beings. We interact with each other. That shapes so much of our experiences. Um, and I do want to mention, I, I, uh, briefly mentioned this before, but social media, AI is not an entirely new thing. Social media, perfect. Social media already has been using AI to power searches when you look for things on Facebook or other platforms to suggest friends. If you're on Twitter and, and a, a person to follow is suggested, or on Instagram if you see content, TikTok is entirely AI powered to see what videos you see. So AI is not a new thing. AI is largely what's been powering social media in this very algorithmic way but AI is taking new forms and it's developing very quickly and that is very unsettling and we really need to keep up and work, I think especially try to emphasize broad principles like transparency and to think about the economic incentives. What's driving the companies to produce these products? How could we drive them to produce them in safer directions and how will these tools be weaponized? But I think that's kind of a broad landscape is when we look to the future in AI, let's not forget to look at the past of social media to see what we still don't know, what are the remaining question marks, and to see what we do know where things went wrong. And especially, I would say, in the US, one thing went wrong, that went wrong is we did not regulate nearly enough. We let these tech giants basically do whatever they want and treat our democracy like a playground where they could just experiment and do things for profit that may have very real implications. So I, I'm worried that we'll repeat the same mistakes but I think we need to ground our, our actions in as much research and honest literacy as we can. Thank you for your attention. Great presentation, Noah. Thank you so much. Um, to start thinking for then the, the dialogue part, I think that will be very important. What is going to be the consequences uh, in the 2024 election? Um, to, to what extent we are going to see a deja vu of the 2016, but now improved with the new technology. And now I have the pleasure to invite uh, to speak uh, uh, Nekela, please. Hi, everyone. Um, so to follow uh, on from some of Noah's um, points, I think one big question mark around the impact of generative AI on the information landscape is you know, to what extent does it simply amplify existing problems and longstanding issues, or does it do anything that is truly novel? And you know, to some to some extent, I think we can say that that we would expect it to amplify existing issues. It will sort of lower the cost and potentially increase the scale of. Um, of influence campaigns and, and disinformation campaigns, make it easier to produce more sophisticated looking content. Um, this is, is, is somewhat linked to, to what Noah was talking about as well in terms of what is the evidence of the persuasive impact. But there is limited evidence that Russia's uh, foreign influence campaign, um, information campaign in the 2016 American election Meaningfully, meaningfully influenced um, electoral outcomes or voting behaviors on a large enough scale to, to produce an impact. Um, but you know, uh, there there is a question mark about the future um, for these types of Russia-backed influence um, campaigns. Generative AI will. Um, lessen the need for human intermediaries, particularly those that are familiar with um, English language and other specific um, information contexts, and make it easier to produce those campaigns on a larger scale. Prior Russia-backed foreign influence campaigns were also marred by 
um, obvious errors. The content they, they produced were, was obviously flawed. There were grammatical errors, um, misused idioms, and incorrectly used backtick, and so on. And generative AI has the potential to blunt those flaws. Um, I also think you know there's a lot of uh, attention on deep fakes and um, visual, video, and audio-based uh, uh, disinformation. But one of the most dangerous potential applications is, um, in my opinion, what Sam Altman called in his testimony be testimony before Congress, the potential of uh, interactive disinformation uh, uh, campaigns. So the the idea that you could have these systematized conversations with voters through phone calls or text messages or personalized chatbots that are sustained over time, where the large language model is trained on manipulation techniques. It's potentially targeting voters' um, uh, particular demographic characteristics. It can draw on a set of responses that are optimized to persuade and can adapt in real time to, to what the voter is saying, potentially can monitor their emotional state as well um, in, a, in a kind of video interaction. Um, that is not something that, that you know, I've seen in the wild, but there is the, the potential for that, and I'd be curious for my, my co-panelist's opinion on, on the likelihood of that kind of um, interactive digital disinformation campaign happening at scale, but I think that is one of the more dangerous possibilities of, of generative AI. Um, the organization that I worked for, work for, the Brennan Center, in the 2022 midterm elections did tracking um, on major social media platforms of misinformation narratives around the election process. Um, we had a team of analysts that tracked uh, and analyzed thousands of posts, and we did an automated analysis of tens of thousands of posts on major social media platforms. And one of the things we found, which is very much consistent with the work of other disinformation scholars, is that there are these core election narratives about false narratives about the election process in the American context that recur over time. So generally speaking, um, people who are trying to undermine the integrity of the election process um, through the information environment are not reinventing the wheel. They're kind of drawing on these time-worn um, false narratives that repeat and recur. And one of the things we know about generative AI tools at that is that they are most effective um, when the content that they're asked to, to produce is uh, resembles the content that they were trained on. So one thing we do know is that there is plenty of past disinformation in the training databases underlying um, generative AI tools such that they could be um, effect, pretty effective at producing um, information, disinformation in the current context. Um, you know, that's, that's true for America, but I think more, um, more analysis and investigation is needed for um, other, other countries, particularly because we know that many of the large language models are trained on English language data sets. So I think that's a sort of gap in our our understanding. Um, I want to briefly touch on um, the use of AI to administer elections by, by election officials. That's not just generative AI, but it's also the other kind of AI, um, the more traditional use of AI to process and synthesize information. Um, so in the American context, AI is used to um, verify mail ballot applications, to maintain voter registration databases. Um, we increasingly see that, that election officials, because they are so under-resourced, and there are many election offices that are just staffed by one or two people, they're interested in using generative AI to communicate with constituents to provide information to them. All of these uses of AI, particularly as AI gets um, either more sophisticated or, or just less kind of understandable, the, the, it's less explainable, um, warrant, um, potentially warrant sort of guardrails to govern, govern their use, to ensure their accur accuracy, to guard against bias, to ensure data training data quality and explainability. Um, so that we, we can safeguard the um, integrity of our, of our elections. Um, one of the things we're seeing in the 
American context is, is the use of a, a new AI tool that is being um, trained and uh, pe uh, people are being trained on and, and it's being tested by, um, by actors that are sort of interested in undermining the election process um, to file mass voter challenges, to challenge voters' registration status. Um, and this tool basically aggregates information from around the web, compares voter registration database information against public records, um, does a fairly rudimentary data matching analysis, and then auto prepares um, challenges to voters' registration status. And you know that is something that, in our view, is very dangerous. It could result in um, improper disenfranchi disenfranchisement of voters. It could um, further burden election offices who are already strained, um, and it could fuel disinformation campaigns. Um, and you know, to to echo something that that Noah said, this isn't. Um, some things that are rightly called AI aren't necessarily that complex or sophisticated, but labeling them as AI, you know, which they are rightly labeled as AI, sort of gives it this um, mystique or a veneer of sophistication and legitimacy that it doesn't necessarily deserve. And that's one of the kind of dangers that we need to look out for as well. Um, and then finally, I'll, t I'll, t I'll talk about a little bit about um, how AI might problematize uh, uh, processes of participatory government. Um, so, uh, you know, in the American context, the idea, ideal of open and responsive government, the idea that um, uh, citizens and other constituents should have opportunities to directly and indirectly participate in governance and um, meaningful opportunities to influence decisions and access to ample information in order to understand what's going on. That's a critical, um, critical part of our process. Uh, we've seen before um, attempts to disrupt the policymaking process through the use of bots to field millions of um, fraudulent or deceptive comments, and, and generative AI makes that kind of process harder to detect harder to detect, um, easier to produce those kind of comments to manipulate perceptions of public sentiment um, in a way that, if done at scale, could make it harder for um, those kinds of systems of participatory government to be, um, to be done at scale. And so I think that's something that we, we need to think about. We need to have policy responses for, um, you know, on the flip side, it could also help governments digest information and process information from the public, but that also needs kind of standards and guardrails um, to ensure that we're doing that um, in a way that isn't biased and is accurate and meaningfully takes into account public input. Um, so those are just some of the things that we're thinking about in the democracy and governance space. Thank you so much, Michaela. Great presentation again, and uh, it will be important in the, in the, during the dialogue to also see what can be the implication or use of uh, artificial intelligence in the funding of political parties and all the issues regarding money and politics. Uh, I think that this is an, an area that I think is it's, it's quite important also to, to explore. And now I have the pleasure to, to give uh, the, the opportunity to share with us uh, his view uh, to Professor Bruce. Bruce, please, go ahead. Hey, good morning. Thanks for inviting me. I want to quickly make sure that we differentiate between what ChatGPT can do right now in September of 2023 with AI in general. It's, it's important not to get wrapped up in the current limitations and capabilities because this technology is changing extraordinarily fast. There are things I've written in March that are no longer true today. Uh, so when I think about AI and how it will change things, I look across four dimensions, speed, scale, scope, and sophistication. Look for changes there, and when changes in degree, make changes in kind. So I have eight examples of where AI can affect democracy and elections. 
Uh, the first is uh, AI as teacher. There's already a lot of work being done. It's, it's sort of better for someone to learn physics instead of from reading a textbook, from conversing with an expert. And an AI can be an expert in that case. So in the uh, democracy context, we can imagine uh, chatbots of candidates where people can engage on what the candidate believes or chatbots on issues which will allow voters to become more sophisticated on climate change or employment policy or whatever. So that's the first thing. Uh, AI is sense maker. A lot of work are being done and have an AI make sense of a large mass of documents. I think of this in terms of constituent comments. Where right now in the US, if you're a legislator, you get letters from your constituents and you put them in two piles, for and against, and you measure the heights of the piles. That's all you can do. An AI can do a lot more, can figure out what are the interesting comments, what are the comments that have been astroturfed. You know, are there people I should talk to further? This also has uh, implications in the discovery process, in litigation, looking at large mass of documents, in intelligence gathering, in law enforcement. So AI is sense maker. I think it's going to be really interesting to watch. The third is AI as moderator. And some experiments here of AIs being used virtually in chat rooms and groups to moderate, to mediate, to help build consensus, to help different, surface different arguments, to make sure people get heard. And you can imagine AIs being able to do this, figuring out uh, what the consensus is, and then further on, maybe even being a decider. Already AIs are being used to decide who gets certain benefits, whether you get a loan or you get admitted to college. You can imagine them being used uh, to decide government benefits. You could even think they might be used in some administrative capacity where we had physical judges but you know, don't have the ability anymore. Uh, number four is AI as a lawmaker. We have already seen AIs write bills in Congress, mostly as a stunt, so not real yet. But it is not unreasonable to think that an AI could come up with policy ideas, can actually write legislation. And actually, more important, an AI can look at existing legislation for loopholes. This is both good and bad. You can imagine an AI looking for tax loopholes to exploit. You can imagine an AI looking at uh, pending legislation for loopholes to close. But that notion of finding loopholes, I think, is something an AI will do. Uh, fifth is AI as a lawyer. We've seen some primitive examples of this in the US. There's a system where you can have a, it's not an AI, but it's an automatic system that'll get you out of paying parking tickets. If you live in New York, it's called donotpay.com. You should use it. But, but this has implications. An AI can help with access to justice. It can help with regulatory compliance. It's a lot of, pro, a lot of work filling out government forms. Right? Can an AI help citizens do that, engage with government, to remove administrative burdens? Some things to watch here, right? Access to justice, is it two-tiered? Right? Do the rich get the human lawyers uh, with the help of AI? Do the poor just get the AI? So yeah, but there is a way that an AI can help people get access to justice in a system that is clogged, that is burdened, and where the humans just can't do enough. Uh, number six, I think of AI as cheap argument generator. So we, you know, not less in the misinformation context, but more in the context of every place you see arguments. You know, if I, if I sue somebody, if I hire a lawyer and engage in a lawsuit, I am signaling. I'm signaling that I'm willing to spend money, right, to make this argument in a court. What happens when those arguments are cheap? When I can get an AI to write a complaint? When I can get an AI to uh, do an administrative takedown under some, uh, oh, some internet rule? As the ability to create the document becomes cheaper, it's going to be used more, and it's not going to have the same type of power. It's not going to signal the same thing. And right now, if I have an AI write you know, 10,000 lawsuits and I file them in the court, human beings have to deal with those lawsuits, and that will destroy the system. So now you imagine that like, an AI will be on the other end doing the other half of that. But you've got to think about that. Uh, number seven, if you're keeping count, uh, AI is law enforcer. So very primitively, right, we have, a, we have computer speed traps. We could easily imagine computer, you know, left on red detectors. The automated detection of, uh, of people violating the law 
is going to become more sophisticated. And you can imagine AIs doing some more sophisticated reasoning before they decide that someone is violating a law. And, and you take that a little further, you can imagine micro-legislations. You can imagine laws being written specifically because we know the AI will be doing the enforcing. And you can imagine laws being designed to a person. And I think this is really interesting to watch sort of as this happens. You know, already the recording industry automates takedown notices. Right? That's very primitive. You can imagine that a lot more sophisticated. And lastly, number eight is AI is propagandist, right? which we've heard a lot about. That's, that's misinformation, disinformation. And I, I worry that this is largely a moral panic. A couple of things I want to talk about. The first one is notion of persona bots. So again, when is it different? Speed, scale, scope, sophistication. So Latanya Sweeney, a professor at Harvard, postulated that you can imagine these personas that are on social media that are just behaving normally. They're in groups of, you know, uh, affinity groups for knitting or this neighborhood. They're like regular people, but once in a while they say something political. They're not propagandist, but occasionally they say something that is propaganda. That's no big deal, but replicated over the millions, that's an enormous deal. And that is something that we can see with AI. And we're likely to see some of this very soon now. So between now and the end of next year, three quarters of people who live in democracies on this planet are going to vote in a national election. And right, this is Argentina like really soon. This is Taiwan in January. Uh, this is Poland, this is the EU, this is the US, this is the UK. These are not small countries. These are not countries for whom you know, don't have geopolitical uh, reasons that other countries care about them. So we are likely going to see the effects of AI propaganda in the next few months. I think Guatemala just had an election. And, and so, you know, so far it hasn't been much. We haven't seen much in Taiwan. And you'd expect to see anything new China is coming up with in Taiwan, but the election's not until January. And historically, powers like Russia and China test their tactics first in smaller countries before they roll them out to the larger countries. So, you know, the EU, the US, UK has to be before January 2024, but it's going to happen this year. We're going to see what will happen in those jurisdictions in other jurisdictions first. So pay attention globally to what is going on with elections in democratic countries because they're going to affect what is coming. So that is my whirlwind tour through how uh, AI might affect democracy. Again, don't get hung up in the limitations of today. Yes, the AI hallucinates. Yes, it can't do math. That kind of stuff is very temporary. You know, it will be hooked up to the internet so it can check URLs. It's already been hooked up to mathematical uh, systems so it doesn't get the math wrong anymore. It will be allowed to use tools soon. APIs are going to be all over these things. And there's a lot of AI that aren't large language models that are also being brought to bear. So that's what I got, and I'm happy to take questions when it's time. Thank you very much, Bruce. Um, regarding Latin America, I think that following what you were saying about the coming elections, we are going to have eight elections in the next 16 months. Uh, I mean, presidential elections. So I think that it will be a fantastic moment to take the, the polls in, in Latin America in order to see what is going to be the impact of this. However, I would like also to invite all of you once we come back after Federico, because we have one more um, speaker, to speak on the good things about artificial intelligence, not only about the threats or the negative, but also what are the positive things that we can identify in order to make a balance between positive and, uh, and negative or, or not so positive aspect. I some Fe good things on my list. <laughs> Federico, eh, bienvenido. Perfect. Bueno, en primer lugar, eh, muchísimas gracias al presidente eh, Leonel Fernández por la invitación. La verdad que es un placer poder estar hoy aquí con ustedes, con los organizadores. Eh, aún a la distancia y después de haber escuchado tres disertaciones brillantes. Eh, la idea que nosotros queremos plasmar desde el Cono Sur 
es justamente eh, reflexionar sobre lo que bien se ha planteado eh, en los momentos previos y es en este impacto de la inteligencia artificial en el sistema electoral. Pero para eso nos parece fundamental entender el escenario mundial al cual nos enfrentábamos ya antes de la disrupción de estas últimas tecnologías, como vamos a ver. A ver, nosotros tenemos instituciones sobre las que se sustentan nuestros sistemas democráticos que estaban basados en una lógica de pensamiento en la cual los países, por lo menos los estados modernos, tenían límites geográficos dentro de los cuales, como bien lo expone Garabedian en Argentina, encontrábamos que los estados tenían soberanía, tenían un territorio determinado, una población, un aparato administrativo y un gobierno. Es decir, que dentro de esos límites el Estado ejercía el poder, dentro de esos límites estaba su población, eh, los congresos dictan normas para esa población que está dentro de esos límites territoriales y la democracia, en líneas generales, es la herramienta en el mundo occidental para elegir a nuestros representantes. Ahora, esos sistemas eran funcionales dentro de la estructura de un mundo real, un mundo en el cual el contacto era un contacto físico y en el cual se ha desarrollado la humanidad desde sus orígenes. El problema es que todo lo ha cambiado la aparición en la década del 90 de Internet. ¿Por qué? Porque cuando aparece Internet, en los hechos, lo que aparece es algo que nunca antes la humanidad había vivenciado, que es la posibilidad de vivir en dos tiempos y en dos mundos a la vez pero además con la paradoja de que en ese mundo virtual o paralelo al cual nos vamos mudando lentamente, eh, tiene eh, o carece en principio de normas o leyes que puedan ser aplicables en toda su extensión. Es decir, venimos de sistemas legislativos, de organizaciones estaduales que reconocen su imperio dentro de unos límites territoriales acotados y de pronto nos hemos encontrado en este siglo XXI en que nos han llevado a un mundo paralelo, un mundo virtual, en donde no hay esos límites geográficos y por lo tanto el gran conflicto como bien se ha planteado en el día de ayer y hoy también en el panel anterior es precisamente determinar cómo se regula, cómo se legisla en un espacio que, que en realidad se ve de esta manera. Es decir, no hay límites geográficos y en donde fundamentalmente las empresas se encuentran con que su clientela, sus usuarios, no tienen nacionalidad. Son usuarios simplemente que están esparcidos a lo largo del mundo. Por eso es que esto genera la primera crisis que impacta dentro de los sistemas estaduales y de los sistemas democráticos. Porque lo que nos tenemos que preguntar es, en este mundo paralelo, ¿quién es realmente el que manda? Y aquí nos encontramos con que, a diferencia de lo que podemos creer que es que los estados son los dueños o son aquellos que pueden establecer las normas, en verdad, hoy tenemos nuevos dueños. Y esos nuevos dueños son estas empresas que, en realidad, por lo general son plataformas, redes sociales, las cuales tienen un impacto y un alcance que nunca antes había visto la humanidad. Conocimos después de la Segunda Guerra Mundial las empresas transnacionales diversificadas a lo largo del mundo, pero con sedes físicas, pero jamás habíamos visto esto que son empresas que directamente habitan en ese mundo paralelo y que congregan a miles de millones de usuarios dentro de las mismas. Esto a mí me parece disruptivo porque mientras que el presidente Biden toma una decisión y en principio puede influir en los 350 millones de habitantes en los Estados Unidos, eh, mientras en mi país el presidente Fernández puede eh, impactar con, su, con sus normas o sus decisiones en 46 millones de habitantes, estas empresas tienen llegadas, por ejemplo, en el caso de Facebook, a casi 3.000 millones de habitantes esparcidos por el mundo. Y todo ello gracias a la incorporación en todos nuestros cuerpos, acompañándonos de este dispositivo que nos ha convertido en una suerte de salvo. Un dispositivo que brinda información consciente e inconsciente de forma permanente. Y esa información, como bien se explicaba hoy en el panel anterior, lo que permite es precisamente el perfilamiento de cada uno de los usuarios. Ese perfilamiento es el que permite que recibamos aquellas noticias que nos parecen, o perdón, aquellas publicidades que nos parecen atractivas. Ahora, una vez que tenemos un perfilamiento de cada uno de nosotros, lo que el sistema o los algoritmos claramente pueden hacer es predecir. Y si pueden predecir, pueden entender el comportamiento que van a tener los humanos y en base a eso formular recomendaciones. 
Eso es lo que hace Netflix, eso es lo que hace Spotify. Es decir, los algoritmos lo que tratan permanentemente es de captar la atención de los usuarios de manera tal de tenerlos permanentemente vinculados, vin permanentemente atentos a su pantalla y consumiendo los servicios de la misma. Para eso generamos dopamina de manera este, constante. ¿Y qué es lo que el sistema pretende? Bueno, la satisfacción del cliente. Ahora, esto se torna más complejo cuando los algoritmos ya no están pensados solamente para el uso de la publicidad, sino empiezan a jugar en el campo de las noticias. Hace siete años, un periódico de los que más ha crecido en el, en el cono sur, como es Infobae, anunciaba que junto con el Washington Post habían creado una herramienta también de reconocimiento de patrones predictiva a los fines de recomendarle a los usuarios aquellas noticias que se condecían con sus gustos. Es decir, lo que nos planteaba desde el Vamos es que a partir de ahora sus recomendaciones iban a estar direccionadas de tal manera de llevarnos a consumir aquellas noticias que eran o se correspondían con aquellos contenidos que a nosotros nos generaban satisfacción, que nos generaban convicción. Por eso es que el medio decía que en los hechos lo que nos estaba brindando a partir de ese momento era una suerte de edición personalizada del diario. Es decir, que lo que buscábamos ahora en esta segunda etapa es la satisfacción del lector. Ahora, cuando las redes sociales empiezan a jugar y a enviarnos ya no solo este, publicidad, sino ahora propaganda, en este caso, de contenido o información vinculada a ideas o a participación política, lo que comienza a hacer es a establecer o reafirmar el sesgo de confirmación. Es decir, como bien dice él y Pariser, más allá de que hay autores que no comparten esta postura, hay algo que sí es cierto, y es que las redes sociales empiezan a filtrar claramente la información que le llega a los usuarios, y de esa información selecciona aquella que se corresponde con los gustos y decisiones o este, eh, preferencias de eh, ese destinatario. Y entonces uno se queda en su zona de confort y por lo tanto consume noticias que solamente son aquellas que confirman sus posturas, en este caso ideológicas, lo cual lleva a que a lograr con los algoritmos la satisfacción del votante. Es decir, del consumidor en realidad hemos pasado al ciudadano. El ciudadano votante en los hechos empieza a recibir aquella información que confirma sus posturas ideológicas y por lo tanto lo lleva a un escenario de convicción permanente. Y esto es uno de los pilares esenciales que eh, lleva a, a eh, eh, colocar en crisis a la democracia. Porque la democracia, como todos lo sabemos, se basa en el consenso y en el disenso, en la interposición u oposición de ideas, en el confronte de ideas, para de esa manera, escuchando al que piensa distinto, obtener una, eh, un resultado que concilie las posturas. El problema es que cuando nosotros empezamos a trabajar en esta idea de recibir solamente durante las 24 horas del día noticias que confirman mis observaciones y mis este, convicciones, esto nos empieza a convertir en tribus, en esta, esta postura tribal, donde todo lo que no está dentro de mi grupo, todo lo que no está dentro de aquellos que piensan como yo en virtud de estos algoritmos con, constantes, bueno, pasa a ser mi enemigo. Y esto es lo que ha generado en el mundo, porque ahora sí que es claramente una línea de quiebre marcada entre los extremos donde los extremismos justamente ya no pueden dialogar entre sí y marcan este, posturas donde lo que se marca es el agravio hacia quien piensa distinto a uno. Y claro, esto es un campo fértil entonces para las fake news, como se habló hoy anteriormente. Si nosotros estamos tan cegados y estamos tan convencidos de nuestras posturas y esto permanentemente a través de las redes sociales es fomentado, es claro que esas noticias pueden ser, o esas fake news, pueden encontrar un lugar propicio. Ahora, cuando estábamos intentando comprender, intentábamos Federico, regular... Federico, tenés un minuto, por favor. Perfecto, ya termino. Cuando estábamos intentando comprender lo que, su lo que sucedía, apareció en el 2017 los Transformers. Y entonces, cuando queríamos entender cómo los algoritmos, a través de Deep Learning, generaban estos, este, estas noticias o eh, nos perfilaban, aparece ahora la IA generativa. 
Y la verdad es que la IA generativa trae nuevos actores, nuevos escenarios, nuevos desafíos, imágenes que son fácilmente este, creadas, este, falsas noticias, imágenes que se vuelven reales para el común de la ciudadanía, que como bien se dijo aquí, no tiene tiempo de comprender o discernir, y por lo tanto, las fake news ahora tienen un potencial que, como bien se dijo recién, va a ser un eh, necesario análisis el que habrá que hacer en las próximas elecciones de los próximos meses. Por eso, es fundamental entonces, cuando, como bien decía Isaac Asimov, la ciencia reúne el conocimiento este, o avanza cada vez más rápido, el problema es que la sociedad no genera la sabiduría. Es muy difícil, sobre todo para el derecho, generar normativa y entender los conceptos cuando la tecnología avanza de manera tan eh, veloz. Muchísimas gracias. Muchas gracias a ti. Well, it was not a fake news when I said at the beginning of the panel that this will be an outstanding panel with four great speakers, so uh, without inter artificial intelligence. So let's go now into the debate. Um, Bruce uh, outlined eight critical points uh, about uh, artificial intelligence, some of them positive, some of them negative. Could you please, Noah, uh, give us a short list of what are the three main positive contributions of artificial intelligence that I think that uh, you would like to share with the audience, please. You can do it from there. Is this working now? Yeah. So I think, you know, we're focusing on democracy and elections, but I think one of the most important tasks for a government is to help usher in new developments in science. I think humanity progresses when our science progresses. It's how we cure diseases, it's how we tackle uh, problems like climate change. And I think it's really inarguable that data has really transformed the way we do science. If you go back to like medicine in the 19th century, a lot of it was guesswork. A doctor had a hunch and they'd give you a treatment, we don't know if it works or not. And medicine was completely revolutionized by bringing in statistics, data. You actually do a randomized controlled study in the 20th century. You can see what's placebo, what actually has an effect, what medicines work, what don't. And it changed, you know, there were so many surgeries we used to do that were just harmful and didn't help. And we didn't know because we didn't use statistics. So the earlier wave of bringing uh, statistics into what we do in our, our endeavors in science and medicine was collect some data and to do some controlled studies, to do p-values, hypothesis testing. That has developed over the years. In the last couple decades, it's developed into what we call big data, where now we're looking at really personalized medicine. Um, political campaigns have used big data to see what individuals we can target with voting um, campaigns to try to uh, get them excited to vote. So I think when you really zoom out and take the big picture, just think of where our society would be without all the medical developments that have happened thanks to basic statistics. Think of all the progress that we've made by having more sophisticated statistics, and I like to put AI in that light. We will make tremendous progress in science and in medicine, and we'll cure diseases as we continue to use AI as a tool for things like understanding protein folding, synthetic biology, genetic editing. So I think Don't think of AI as this magic entity that will solve all these problems. Think of it as a powerful tool, just like statistics has been for the last 200 years, a powerful tool to help us understand our world and understand medicine. And specifically regarding democracy, what will be the two, three, just outline the most positive impact that you see that artificial intelligence can contribute? Well, I think Bruce talked a bit more about directly how democracy will be using AI, but I, I really want to zoom out and think one of the most central tasks of our democracy in the next decades will be climate change. I think democracies will fail if we don't address it, and our success as humanity is, is central to this. And I do think artificial intelligence has to play a central role here. If we just let it run amok, it'll cause harm because we're going to be using computers that emit carbon emissions, that use up water, So AI could harm us in this endeavor, but if we can really harness it and try to use it as a tool, not expecting it to solve things on its own, but to help empower human scientists, human politicians, I think, again, think of how our world has changed thanks to statistics. We need that kind of force to tackle the next generation of problems, and climate change is, is central to that, central to AI, and central to democracy. Thank you very much. Michaela, what will be your positive aspects regarding 
artificial intelligence and democracy particularly? Yeah, sure. So I, I touched on some of the risks for participatory government in, um, in my remarks. And, you know, I think there are also potential benefits, which um, Bruce touched on as well. Um, for example, in the American context, on proposed rulemakings, uh, proposed regulations, agencies will often take in thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of comments from the public. And it's well documented that um, because they're taking in such a large volume, in part, um, agencies tend to discount uh, the large numbers of value-laden comments from constituents in favor of a relatively small number of comments that are very technical from relatively well-resourced actors, very well-educated actors. And so, you know, there potentially is, um, is the potential for the use of AI systems that analyze, aggregate, um, and, and parse through um, public comment to more meaningfully take in, into account a larger number of, of public comments. Um, and then, you know, the same thing for constituent communications. There is already the existing use of um, AI chatbots by some government entities to communicate with constituents. That's not um, generative AI ch chatbots typically. It's sort of rule-based chatbots that spit out pre-vetted, they, they um, identify keywords and then spit out pre-vetted responses or they're kind of conversational agents like Alexa or Siri. Um, but, uh, and, and we know that when constituents don't receive a response from, from their um, elected official or their government official that they tend to, um, you know, become more disengaged or they, they look very unfavorably on that. And so there's a pot potential to, to communicate more effectively with constituents, but we also know that, that the public doesn't really like um, communicating with chatbots, and so, you know, there need to, need to be um, developments, and they're also, in both of those instances that I outlined, I think there do need to be standards around bias and accuracy. Um, there's the risk um, in, in the participatory democracy context that um, agencies might use AI to justify their predetermined approach, and so we really want to make sure that they really are using it to meaningfully take um, public comments into account. So I think there are both benefits, but there need to be guardrails as well. Great. Thank you so much. Bruce, you, you already mentioned a few of them. There are some two or three that you really think that in the coming years are going to be very critical in order to improve because we are aware that democracy is under threat and there is a lot of tensions globally and also in this region. So how can artificial intelligence can help to improve the confidence, the trust on, on democracy, and also improve the quality of democracy? So I think trust is an important word that was said here. It's important to understand that these large language models, these AIs, are very complex, very large, very expensive things to create. And they're being created by for-profit corporations, largely monopolies, for their benefit. And if we want to have an AI that helps democracy, it has to be something that is designed by the public. And if you query an LLM about, I don't know, unionization, are you going to get accurate facts? Are you going to get the facts that the designers wanted you to? If you query it about a candidate or an issue, are you going to get information or someone paying the AI on the back end to move you in a certain direction? We're not going to know any of this. And so it's really important when we think about building these IIs, for, for me to all the things of good that we're talking about, that if they are going to be designed and built by for-profit corporations for their profit, they'll never truly be our agents, they'll be double agents. Right? They'll be secretly working for something else. Just like when you go to Google, right, you see real entries, you see entries that were paid for you to see. When you go on Amazon, first seven screens are products that have been paid to, for you to see. That's the way the internet works. That's the way AI is going to work. I worry about that a lot. Uh, second thing I want to, I want to very quickly, a lot of talk about existential risk, right, that the AI will destroy humanity. The, the common thought experiment is the paperclip maximizer, right? The AI is told to make paperclips, and it makes paperclips mm -hmm. even as it destroys all of Earth's resources. It's a very weird fear, right? It, the AI could, I don't know, uh, prove a bunch of obscure mathematical theorems or solve all the world's problems. 
But instead, it's doing this maximizing thing. Uh, science fiction writer uh, Ted Chang talks about this and says, look, that idea is every startup's business plan. And people's fears of AI are actually misplaced fears of capitalism. And Charlie Strauss, another science fiction writer, goes further and calls corporations slow AI, that they are profit-maximizing entities that do everything they can on that single goal. We are terrible at regulating slow AI in the United States. Mm -hmm. right? And regulating fast AI will be just as hard. But really thinking about the essential humanity and how we ensure that that is paramount, and whether it's against slow AI corporations or fast AI, the technical kind, and that's another way we can ensure these technologies help democracy and not hinder democracy. I get it that these are hard solutions. Great, thank you so much. Federico, eh, yendo a ti y viendo desde América Latina, esta mañana en el panel anterior se hablaba de que solamente ocho países de América Latina tienen algún tipo de legislación, solamente tres tienen protección de propiedad intelectual y solamente uno tiene protección de datos, si mal no recuerdo. ¿Cuál es el estado un poco de situación en, en, en América Latina del debate sobre la relación entre inteligencia artificial, elecciones y democracia? Tomando en cuenta, como decíamos, que se vienen seis elecciones presidenciales, ¿ves un fuerte impacto, un, un uso creciente de estas tecnologías en las elecciones, en la democracia y en el debate de América Latina? En el caso, por ejemplo, de la República Argentina, nosotros en las elecciones del año 2019, ya el, eh, el Consejo Electoral eh, celebró acuerdos con las principales plataformas a los fines de eh, resguardar y evitar el, eh, la diseminación de eh, eh, fake news eh, durante la campaña. Eh, a su vez, Brasil eh, ha vivido justamente un periodo en el cual eh, se ha trabajado sobre eh, la problemática a partir de lo que fue la campaña de elección del expresidente Bolsonaro eh, y recientemente en el mes de mayo eh, re, se, en la Cámara de Diputados volvieron a discutir la ley de fake news que había tenido media sanción en el año 2020 eh, finalmente quedó en suspenso pero eso se reavivó a partir de lo que fue la, este, el avance sobre el eh, edificio del Plan Alto donde está el gobierno, la sede central del gobierno de, eh, eh, el, del Brasil eh, ante estos escenarios es claro que los países están discutiendo, Argentina tiene también proyecto de ley, Chile ha, es quien más creo yo hoy está trabajando en la temática de eh, regulación y desarrollo a partir de su comisión de eh, desafíos del futuro dentro del Senado eh, y claramente que esto es una preocupación constante fundamentalmente porque eh, estas herramientas eh, están direccionadas eh, en líneas generales a la, a la juventud, a los más jóvenes y por lo tanto eh, direccionan, como lo explicábamos recién, muchas de las decisiones de eh, estos grupos etarios. Por lo tanto nosotros sí hemos tenido eh, desarrollo, es una preocupación claramente en la región eh, y se ha trabajado desde los organismos electorales de una manera en principio preventiva, pero trasladando la tarea a eh, las plataformas tal como, por ejemplo, lo ha hecho este, eh, Europa con la ley de servicios digitales, donde claramente ha establecido y ha tomado partido en relación a quién debe ser responsable para garantizar eh, los, eh, una este, elección que no esté atacada o bombardeada por noticias falsas. Muchas gracias, Federico. Eh, Noa. It's possible to imagine that in the next election in one year or maybe in the coming election, um, instead of having two groups of very talented people making the strategy for the electoral campaign, we are going to have two very talented group of people using chat GPT-4 in order to in really ways saying, okay, advise me which is the best way to win this election, and on the other side, another chat, GPT, doing the same. And essentially, this will be about 
artificial intelligence competing one uh, uh, among other instead of just real people. That is, is, is possible? Well, I think it's very <sighs> tempting to see a lot of powers in these AIs. And I, th I just want to sort of caution about, just to kind of remind us all to think about what data does it actually have access to? What does it collect? We don't know what it was fully trained on, but we know, do know that they were trained on web pages, on social media, on books. This is all static, static information that's out there. The reason I want to emphasize that is there's no way you can discern from that some magical ability to predict the future. So if you ask ChatGPT, you know, what message is going to work well in this upcoming campaign? How can I convince people? It may just not know because it doesn't go out in the field. It doesn't try and do experiments, right? Human political scientists and campaigners can go and talk to people. They can in interview a focus group. They can collect live data to inform their decisions. So I think it's a little bit naive to expect a bot that's just been trained on all this static text that's out there to somehow know the more dynamic interactions that are needed for political campaigns. There's information there. I think it would be a mistake to rely heavily on it. They will certainly use it as a tool. They'll write a lot of political ad campaign material mm -hmm. using it. But to just say, like, give us the best strategy, I don't foresee that coming. Bruce does say AI will change, so maybe in the future. But for now, we're not there, in my opinion. Bruce, thank you, Noah. Bruce, you want to? So I think that is, that is changing. I mean, I, having AIs able to run focus groups, m make polls, query things, use Quora, use uh, TaskRabbit, right? use a Mechanical Turk. These things are coming, and not far away. I mean, Microsoft is working on building uh, API, direct API use into its current AIs. I mean, I wouldn't let an AI like run the campaign, but, at, but AI as political strategist, suggesting ideas, being part of a, a human AI conversation will likely result in a better outcome than just human or certainly just AI. And that's the way to think of these futures. Not that the AIs will take over. They're going to become part of what has been solely a human process. So the human process of figuring out like, you know, what political messages work, what campaign slogans work. Right? That is a human iterative process which will include AIs to some degree. And will they do better? You know, we will see. Eventually, probably yes. Is that eventually sooner and far away? We don't know. It's really hard to predict timelines here. And we don't know if things are like a little bit hard or a lot hard. Thank you. Michaela, and what about political ads and deep fake? Yeah, sure. So, I, I mean, I, I want to pick up a little bit on, on what has been said sure. as, as well. Um, I think when we're, when we're thinking through how we should regulate the use of um, AI by campaigns and by other political entities, one of the things that I've been thinking about is what is it that we're actually worried about? So if somebody um, uses ChatGBT to help them write a campaign email and then it goes through several layers of review it's, by humans, it's not clear to me that that is so different uh, or much more concerning than, than what is already happening. Um, what is more concerning to me is the sort of release, to, release of unsupervised chatbots into the wild where there is you know, no sort of human oversight or um, intentional deception is also concerning, which is um, you know, the, the, that's also where political ads and deep fakes come in. Um, so you know, I, I think in general it, it, it's helpful to step back and say, what is different? Um, what actually are we worried about here? And, and can we imagine it that using deep fake because one thing is to receive a fake news through WhatsApp. But the completely different is to see President Fernandez saying something that President Fernandez didn't say. And what I'm seeing is, hey, it is perfect. I, I think that is President Fernandez saying that. Uh, I see Messi now speaking fluent English. Messi cannot say yes in English. And he speaks fluent English, you know? Uh, I mean, this is, this is not uh, an invention. This is what I saw. I saw Messi and I said, wow, he just came to Miami and, and, and his English is much better. No, it's, it's not better. It's, it's artificial intelligence making Messi speaking fluent English. 
by the way, in a very good English. So when President Fernandez said, I didn't say that, then you have to say, okay, uh, who, who trusts? Is what he said or is now that he's saying, I didn't say that? In a moment in a society where trust is very low. So how that can affect highly polarized, very competitive uh, elections that uh, now are using this new highly sophisticated technology. Bruce. So I think it's less than you think because in, in, in that future world, that is going to happen all the time. Right? If you say something that isn't you and you go out and say, look, I didn't say that, everyone will say, oh yeah, it must have been a chatbot. Because we will all know that chatbots do that. So you move forward to the world where that's common, that's now common. And, we, and, and everyone will know when they see a video, it, and, and the person said they didn't say that, that that's perfectly reasonable. As opposed to 10 years ago, that would be a ridiculous defense. I never said that. It's on video. Of course you said it. So the world is changing. Most of us use these memes as social signaling. They're not, people aren't getting the truth of them. They're sharing them because they espouse their worldview. And the lousy fakes, we, in the US we've had what we call cheap fakes, which are like minimally doctored videos. They're shown on Fox News. People don't care if they're true. They share them if they, if they magnify their worldview. So we're already in that world. People are seeing this and, and, and being told all the time it's not real. I don't think it's that big a problem. But this is in the United States, not necessarily in our countries. In our countries, we have not yet reached that level. And that's why I think that can be very dangerous. What do you think, Federico? ¿Qué piensa sí. Federico en el caso de América Latina o Argentina? Esto no está tan extendido como aquí en Estados Unidos. Bueno, concuerdo absolutamente con lo que planteabas. Eh, nosotros Más alto, vivir... si puedes, el volumen. Ah, perdón. Sí, ¿me escuchan? Ahí. No. A ver, ahí. Hola. Ahí está mejor. Perfecto. No, concuerdo absolutamente con tu planteo. En realidad, uno de los grandes problemas que ya hemos experimentado durante la guerra de Ucrania... Eh, Vladimir Zelensky este, tuvo que eh, sufrir la difusión de un video en el cual eh, llamaba a sus ciudadanos a rendirse y que era claramente un deepfake. Eh, la pregunta ahora entonces es, ¿cómo hacemos con una población que recibe eh, permanentemente esas noticias que, que buscan impactar eh, y justamente eh, se presentan absolutamente reales gracias a la eh, IA generativa? Eh, en nuestros países, por lo general, como todavía siguen siendo la excepción, los medios tradicionales que todavía tienen un gran alcance, de inmediato se hacen eco. Nosotros aquí en Argentina hemos vivido recientemente una alteración de una imagen del presidente de la nación en el cual en realidad lo que habían hecho era ralentizar su este, exposición y parecía que estaba bajo los efectos del alcohol. Y en realidad lo único que se había hecho era modificar la velocidad en la cual eh, el presidente estaba dando eh, ese discurso. En el caso de Chile, por ejemplo, Chile ha, está debatiendo eh, un proyecto de ley para establecer como agravante en los tipos penales el uso de la inteligencia artificial. China ya ha dictado una normativa específica para el uso de las eh, deepfake y ha regulado el uso de la IA generativa y ya en principio se ha difundido, difundido una primera condena por el uso de eh, chat GPT-4 para crear eh, información eh, falsa. Creo que, en realidad, uno de los mayores desafíos, y vos preguntabas recién, bueno, ¿cuáles podrían ser las este, eh, facetas positivas para la democracia de la inteligencia artificial? Y esto me parece muy importante para marcar las, las luces y sombras. En realidad, estos sistemas también nos pueden servir para automáticamente identificar cuando eso es falso y diseminar con la misma velocidad en que se ha difundido ese video falso que vos ponías como ejemplo del el presidente Fernández diciendo algo que no ha dicho, bueno, eh, eh, que con esa misma velocidad las grandes plataformas sean las que tengan que difundir eh, la información de que ese video es falso. Creo que ahí la IEA juega esa do, ese, ese doble este, perfil que bien plantea en su último libro, La Próxima Ola, eh, uno de los creadores de DeepMind, donde dice, sin la IA no vamos a poder subsistir como eh, sociedad humana, pero también con la IA corremos el riesgo de dejar de ser una sociedad humana. Gracias, Federico. Final comments, one minute each, in order to 
closing the, this fantastic panel. Uh, Noah, please. I, yeah, for my final comment, I want to highlight this discussion about deep fakes and just say there's two prominent examples. One that just came up, which was the Zelensky one in Ukraine, where he seemed like he was saying that they should surrender. This one had, as far as we can tell, almost no impact because, first of all, it's low quality, but the main issue was the target. He could go and speak to his audience, speak to news outlets, and say, that wasn't me, that was fake. And anyone who you know, is willing to trust him can. So that actually had no real consequence. On the other hand, in the 2016 campaign in the US when Donald Trump was running, right before one of the presidential debates, a very damning video came out where we had his voice saying some very offensive things. At the time, he accepted it, admitted it was him, but years later, when he was in office, he actually said, no, that wasn't me, that, that was fake. And this, I think, is the much greater risk. It's not, I mean, I, I agree with Bruce that we're gonna see so many fake videos that if there is a fake video of, of the president, the president can say, no, that wasn't me. And that's fine, we'll resolve it. The bigger problem is when there is a true evidence, it's so easy for any politician to deny it and say, no, that's a fake. That's and there's no way to clear the record. So I think that's the asymmetry. If it's not you and you have a public voice, you can easily clear the record. But if you are an, a not credible politician, it's so easy for you to hide any video, audio, text evidence because you can just say, it's all fake, it's AI. And I don't see a good way around that yet. Great, thank you so much. Michaela. Uh, sure, so I will just highlight a couple of things to do with solutions. Um, I think one of the big problems we're grappling with in the American context is the lack of expertise um, on technical issues in Congress and within federal agencies. Um, there is, uh, and because um, expertise is dis disproportionately concentrated at tech companies, tech companies have a big sway over what, how Congress is, is acting at the moment. Um, there is moves towards setting up a tech agency to um, to regulate um, this kind of thing, but but you know it's very hard to to move anything forward in Congress at the moment. But I think this is something that will be an issue across various countries. Um, the issue of how to build in expertise and infrastructure in the governing bodies that need to um, regulate uh, these industries. Um, and and then the second issue that I'll bring up is is to what extent. Um, ought regulatory uh, systems, uh, should they be overarching or sector specific? I think there are some combination is needed in the dem democracy and election space. Um, so we need some election specific regulations, but there are also overarching sort of regulations around transparency and um, uh, ri potentially risk-based assessments and standards. Um, that, that are going to apply in other contexts, but will um, also you know, need to apply, obviously, in the elections and democracy context. Um, yeah, so those are a couple of the things that I'll mention. Fantastic, I like very much this, how to build the capacity so legislators can really understand what they are going to regulate, because my impression, in the case of Latin America, I think that is even worse, that, there is no real capacity to really understand the complexity of what we need to regulate in many cases. Bruce, please, your final comments. I think we really need to think about the power imbalance here. I'm a, I'm a big fan of assistive tech. Right? If, uh, if an AI can help you write a better letter to your uh, legislator, that's great. Help you uh, navigate government services and get them more efficiently, that's fantastic. These tools are likely to be employed by the powerful to increase their power and whether it is AI as political lobbyist or AI as a tax loophole generator, it's not gonna be me, it's gonna be in the basement of Goldman Sachs. And to the extent that these technologies increase existing and power imbalances, they are not gonna be a net benefit for humanity. To the extent that they can smooth out power imbalances, they will be. And that's as small as me versus a corporation, that's as big as you know, a country in the global south versus the United States. I mean, these technologies are largely imposed on the world, you know, by the U.S., but really by a sort of, sort of right libertarian, white male Silicon Valley United States. And that is the technology the world gets. That, that can't be. We really need to figure out how to make these technologies more egalitarian, more democratic, serving humanity, and not, not just the powerful few. Great point, because 
of the limitation, great point, Bruce, because of the limitation of time, we were not able to address also the issue of how artificial intelligence can increase inequality. And I think that this is one of the critical issues within democracy, no? the, the issue of, of inequality. Your final comment, tus últimos comentarios, Federico, y cerramos. Sí, Daniel, pero creo que en realidad uno eh, a, los, a lo largo de los años creía que cada una de las innovaciones tecnológicas era la más disruptiva y que estábamos llegando a un escenario de máxima. Y la verdad es que hoy estamos frente a lo que va a ser y va a marcar los próximos tiempos, que es precisamente la inteligencia artificial general. Si los temores que teníamos antes con los desarrollos de Machine Learning ya preocupaban con el impacto de las redes sociales, bueno, justamente ahora lo que tenemos es un escenario absolutamente eh, eh, inexplorado y que va a necesitar de todos los actores un trabajo en conjunto. Aquí creo yo no hay eh, buenos ni malos, no hay eh, los que están de un lado y del otro. Creo que todos tenemos que trabajar en pro de encontrar soluciones a los fines de poder eh, canalizar los procesos democráticos dentro de los carriles que la humanidad conoció eh, y utilizar las, los sistemas de inteligencia artificial para acercar el conocimiento a la ciudadanía y por el otro ser faros de advertencia cada vez que hay un mal uso de estos sistemas eh, cuando lo que se persigue es justamente conspirar contra esos procesos democráticos sanos. Muchísimas gracias. I would like to request a big applause for our panelists. Great panel. Thank you so much.